never forget the occurrence and that we continue to educate the next generation that's and the generation that believes it didn't happen. I agree, I agree with you. That's one of the reasons I'm here. History doesn't go away. It follows us throughout. You're here because I called you every five minutes and told you what a great moderator you were. No, I'm just not <laughs> winging it. I'm winging it. I'm trying to figure out. So we got three minutes before the real show begins. Uh, anybody else? Yes, please. Uh, my... Yeah. Support of Ruthie and uh, Sandy Schiller uh -huh. with their book, Try to Remember, Never Forget. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in what that means, never forget. Because it, the answer, the question that follows that is, never forget what? And, and that's, and that's something I think that, uh, I know there are a lot of history buffs here, but uh, we're, we're also living in, the, in present times. And there are good reasons never to forget. Yes? Blind nationalism kills people. Blind nationalism, yeah. God, thank God that's over. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're getting we're cut pretty close. <laughs> yes? Uh, after visiting the uh, Holocaust Museum, it was just like, I, this has actually popped out for this day. It's like, I'm the, the only one I want to go to is this one. Woo! And it was because yes. of, I, I just went to the Holocaust Museum mm -hmm. in, in June with a couple of our high schoolers, and they said I wasn't expecting that. Like just going through it, I think mm -hmm. it's really important for this one, not just this genocide, but then even just everywhere. They Which have all museums? One in DC. The one in DC, yes. Uh, but we have a lot. There's a good one in Paris. There's a good one in Berlin. There's a good one in Munich. Yeah. Europe, Europe tends to keep history around a little longer than you. Maybe that's why they remember things that we forgot. Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm covering that. Okay. And I think it's really important that these voices be preserved. And also that people see that, that our times are not that different, that uh, things creep up on people, and that things that we think are unspeakable could still happen. Right. Because they've happened in the past. So mostly I think it's important to preserve these voices. Wait, can I ask you are you covering all this award? She's going to do a mic check, and one of the things she learned when she was younger was to count like a gypsy in check. So here we go. <laughs> Okay, we can hear you. <laughs> Once again, thank you for coming to um, the Comics and the Holocaust panel here uh, on such a sunny day in beautiful San Diego. Um, my name is Eagle Goldkind. As I said previously, I, I, I... Oh, I'm up there. <laughs> I, I am the author of numerous publications. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a comics writer and a promoter, and uh, I just wrote a book called Is She Available? which does touch upon the Holocaust in an expressive, artistic way. And that's the main reason I'm here, is to create a little bit of context as to what comics have to do with the Holocaust. And what comics have to do with the Holocaust have to do with what comics have to do with art, and what human experience and human suffering has to do with the human expression, what we express. Now, in the early 90s, I was involved in convincing people that comics was actually not just an art form, but a literary genre. And I had moderate success doing that, um, but with a lot of help from some very good writers. 
Um, but the idea of, of art, uh, of comics being art, is really, now it's acceptable, at the time it wasn't, but to me, it, it, to not consider comics an art form or a medium in itself is kind of like saying the Beatles weren't musicians. You know, just because you reach a lot of people doesn't mean that you have nothing to say or nothing worth saying. So that's my interest in it. Also, how we as a species turn to art and expression as a way of coping and managing and making sense of our suffering. That's another interest I have. Because I think that that's what we can never forget is that the ideas that fueled um, this horrific episode in the 20th century are not ideas that have diminished. These ideas still circulate. And uh, I'll say one, one thing before I introduce Ruth. The, the biggest idea, my father having been a veteran, my, uh, my grandparents and all the familiar connections I have to the Holocaust, the main idea that I was told that succeeded was to dehumanize people, to create a category for people in which they could be processed, not as human beings, but as commodities. And if there's something not to forget, I think that's the thing not to forget. Um, look, with no more ado, I, I mean, I, I don't want to hesitate anymore, but uh, I'd like to introduce you to Ruth, and Ruth, who is uh, a camp survivor as a young girl, she, she was in, um, she was interred, and she made a point of looking at the art and the expressions that people were trying to create to cope with the circumstances that they were in. So with no further ado, here's Ruthie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for all of you for being here. Good afternoon. My name is Ruth Sachs. I'm a Holocaust survivor, not from one or two, but from three camps, only to the return to the first camp where I was liberated. I'm not sure if you ever met a Holocaust survivor, so here I am. <laughs> As I look around the room, I see that my life has gone from Holocaust hell to now come it come. <laughs> <laughs> I am 90 years old, and I can tell you that at my age, I have reached new first by being here, and I truly love what I have seen so far. There is more creativity in this building right now, and this is freedom. Growing up, I was an only child, and very spoiled. I had a nanny too. I don't know if you see much difference from when I was one year old to now. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly don't see any difference except I was pushed in a baby carriage, and now I am being pushed in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I was 10, I did hear the name Hitler and did see him from our balcony window, but only once. On March 14, 1939, our home was invaded and it happened on my mother's birthday. Nazis felt free to take what they wanted, including the family car. I was 11 years old and at the time, after the invasion, it was impossible to be sheltered by my parents, and being a Jew was a day of that could not be escaped. I was marked by having to wear a Jewish star. They gave us, and it was worn until our liberation in 1945. In the camp itself, we had uniforms or the marked dresses, so we did not need it, the Jewish star. Had we not worn our star, we were subjected to beatings or even death. This is what I wore in the concentration, to the concentration camp. 
The photo was taken two days before I was transported and left in the camera. A relative who said she was not Jewish faced family photos in the camera. After the operation, I let the film develop and realized this was my outfit and yes, it was taken away. More details about my life. are in the book, Try to Remember, Never Forget, written by my daughter next year. <laughs> Do I remember comics and graphics drawings as a child? Yes. I do remember my mom asking my non-Jewish girlfriend to get a copy of the Stürmer, a magazine, a German magazine. Her mother brought this to us, leaving the magazine at the door in hopes not to be seen visiting a Jewish paper. We were shocked and surprised by the propaganda and the way of Jewish persons were portrayed. I remember being scared, wondering how could this be. Again, it was something we could not run away from, and being Jewish was a way of life. Also, I was very young and a child. Did I draw what I saw in the camps? No, but my art teacher, Otto Unger, did. Otto was a wonderful math teacher and a painting teacher and could draw what he saw to perfection. Chances are that if I drew what I saw and had been caught, this could have been the end of my life. My daughter will talk to you about that this in a bit. As for art supplies, we had none. I was working in the camps, just in the children's garden, and then transferred to Auschwitz for a brief period. I did face Dr. Mengele six times. To make myself look older, I smeared red coffee wrappers to help me have that rosy glow. I looked older and healthier, and my mother did this to look younger. After Auschwitz, I was transferred to Öderan, where I worked in an ammunition factory. Just so you know, I took sand and street bullets so that they were not usable and felt I could save lives from having bullets that would not work. <laughs> yeah. Here you can see pieces of metal from the bullets where I made a present for my mom and for me, a necklace. Also, I made things from bread and spit using whatever colors I could find on the floor and in the dirt. After the war, my art classes came in handy and I applied my knowledge to the drawing and the designated designing clothes and costumes. I had dreams of going to Paris and creating for a lot but thank God I met my husband of 63 years and came to America. I did not know about the superhumans such as Captain America and Superman and other comic characters they created during the war time. Maybe had I known about the Superman, I might have had a more hope and faith that I would be saved one day. Although my prayers were answered, it took longer than I thought. I did even know about Kristallnacht until the war ended. As you know, we had no internet, and the radio was our only source, and then it was taken away from knowing anything and entering the camps, and then we heard nothing. I have two sayings. God created such a beautiful world, only some people make it so miserable. <laughs> I am here today to remind you that another Holocaust will not be tolerated 
again and by having you here today you are showing an interest in holocaust awareness in the art from the past of course you can show all of the drawings and graphics but we can get you to start on your journey for seeking this knowledge my next saying is what we shall rise above things as I have done. I'm living proof that hope is what put my family and me through one of the worst atrocities in the history of the world. Yes, my mother, my father, and I made it through the Holocaust only to return our bomb out city where we were the only surviving family unit I will pass this smile to Igor so we can continue seeing different images from what I was exposed to along with characters, comics, graphics that were popular during the war and my time in the Holocaust. You will learn of the superhumans that were created by Jews that were thrown out of Europe in the 30s. Hitler did everything he could to control the intelligence by throwing out Jewish university students and professors. Some of these people were the most brilliant and most intelligent in the world, and thank God they found other countries that allowed them to continue their destiny. I look at comics from the past. They tell so much with very few words. Some of the propaganda images are difficult to see at times, but I am here now and I'm free in a country and can say this is past. You now can say that you met a Holocaust survivor and from three different camps. And now, here has, of course, written a book about an account uh, about the role that, that art has played in the Holocaust. And um, I also forgot to uh, introduce um, uh, uh, Esther and Scott. Um, sorry, uh, Robert. Robert. Robert Scott. You're good friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a world one today. Um, uh, Robert Scott, who, who, who runs uh, Kamikaze Comics and has also been stocking comics that are kind of more documentary, more about the uh, accounts of history. Um, but really, Sandy, you should step in and talk about I'm going to step yourself. right in. Mm -hmm. Let me start by saying that um, tonight we will be at Liberty Station at 6 o'clock. Ruthie and I, thank you, Robert. Um, from Kamikaze, we um, will be at Liberty Station. Ruthie will be talking about her life and not about the comics, what happened based on our book, Try to Remember, Never Forget. And we have a Facebook page, which is Try to Remember, Never Forget. So hopefully I'll get to see a lot of you on the page. You can see all the things that's happened. Um, I'm talking about my relative that was killed and her artwork that was discovered under her pillow. My mother's personal art teacher that she talked about, Otto Unger, that was killed. Dina Babbitt, an artist that traded in her death sentence for doing art for Dr. Mengele. Some pretty strong propaganda. And lastly, art that was found recently by a museum of drawings that were done by American soldiers in 1945. Before I forget, just so you know, Ruthie faced Dr. Mengele nude six times. Okay, she was 16 years old when she did this. I just had to bring that up to you. So I'm sorry, but I'm sitting next to a superhuman without a cape. <laughs> we will start with my cousin. Her name is Kitty Brunerova, and in the book, it'll talk about how did I get the photograph, but I don't have time to talk about it now but she was transported to Auschwitz where she was killed. 
her artwork was found under her pillow. And this word says Shkola, so you can see the school. And believe it or not, her artwork was made into a postage stamp. And you can find this at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My mother mentioned a magazine called Der Sturmer. And in 1938, you can see everybody going, yaw. And the interesting thing about this was people did not understand the views, but they accepted them. And people wanted to believe in something. And I believe that even today, we all want to believe in something. Imagine having a book. Let's see. Here we go. Um, imagine having a book that portrays the Jew with a mushroom nose. And just so you know, after the camps, my mother continued her education. She was 17 years old, but she continued it with a group of 12-year-olds. And I'll give you an example of her math class. One bad Jew plus one bad Jew equals two bad Jews. My grandmother complained because this was after the war. And the other thing is one of the teachers went to my mother and said, do not get too close to me because your smell makes me sick. And this is again, from 1945 on. I think she smells pretty good. <laughs> Here is a poster letting people know that there is the cause of the war, the Jew. And again, this is from Der Sturmer. In 1945, they were recruiting children to fight. My mother remembered asking a German soldier with the bayonet how old he was. How old was he, Mom? Yeah, he was 16 years old. So, the father is in the military. The mother was an overseer. The mother is an overseer. And the guys were watching. And the guys were on the front line. 16 years old. 16 years old. Mm -hmm. When she was transported, and there was a guy with a bayonet, she actually said to him, you know, as she was being liberated, how old are you? And the guy sitting there with his bayonet, 16. We'll talk about that tonight at 6 if you happen to be there. Mm. With so many hand-drawn pictures, because there were no photograph photographs, this gives you an idea of what a prisoner saw. So as you're looking at this picture, you can see that the Jew is hanging, but they made sure there was extra rope and extra hemp. My mom's teacher was Otto Unger, and you can see the way he drew Theresienstadt. Also, here's another picture of him. His fingers were cut off, and then he was transported to Auschwitz, where he was killed. I met a very interesting woman, um, the daughter, and her mother's Dina Babbitt, and she was in line to be gassed along with her mother in Auschwitz. She was an artist who drew the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs on the back wall of the children's section in Auschwitz. Dr. Mengele had a hard time matching skin tones and there was no photography to do it. So he went to Dina and he said, I need a, uh, a, a soldier, I need a, a survivor, I need somebody, a prisoner, who can um, um, be an, who's an artist. And Dina was in line with her mother and she went to Dr. Mengele and said, as long as my mother is in this line, you may as well kill both of us. So they spared her, and they spared the mother. Years later, Dina returned to Auschwitz to get the images that were hers, but they told her they were a national treasure, and they weren't going to release them. So there's a lot of controversy there, because if you go to Auschwitz, you do see Dina's work, the family would like to get them, but it's a fine line. In the book that I wrote, my mother, when we tour, and you'll see it tonight, we actually show the dress that my grandmother wore in Auschwitz. That's the X that you see with the line, and that's the logo of, of our book. Now, that doctor, what do you call it? The, the Nazis gave that to us, and I've adopted it. Um, so anyway, um, Dina passed away. 
I do talk to her daughter periodically, but again, this is one of the subjects we don't talk about too much. And there's a picture of Dina right there. Also, there was a Dina comic strip which talks about her life. So if you're on the internet, you can read about Dina. And this actually tells Dina's story, and that's on the internet too. I found a book for my mother, and they drew what they saw, and it was all about what all the different people saw in Theresienstadt. Now, next, we will see drawings from soldiers that were discovered, Jewish prisoners in cave in 1945, I'm going to ask somebody to stand up right now. I need David Beck Brown and Sharon Bear to stand up for me. I wanna thank them so much because these images that you're gonna see have never been seen before by anybody. And they were kind enough to let me have permission to view these. There's my permission slip. <laughs> There is a short video that I'm going to play. And with your permission, I'm going to be showing the next few photos in silence. I believe it's the only way they had a chance. So the story goes, the partisans killed 36 German policemen. Hitler ordered for each dead policeman for 10 partisans to, to be killed. So they killed 336. They put them in a cave, each one was shot in the back of, of the head. And uh, then they blew up the, the cave so that they couldn't be found. But in 1945, they found them. Here, I'm gonna put this back in. Uh, yes, um, I guess I'll, your introduction is right there, Esther. Yeah. It's okay. So I can read it aloud? No, 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 no. Let's just keep moving. Mm. Mm. My role today is to provide historical context and to speak about some of the artwork done by Jews in the United States during the Holocaust era. Most of the early creators of superhero comics were Jews, but in the few minutes allotted to me, I'll talk about how Nazi racial propaganda might have played a role in the genesis of Superman. I will also introduce Arthur Schick and Lily Renee Wilhelm, two Jews who escaped Europe during the war and were artistic pioneers who made their mark in the US. Let's begin with the Superman mythology. 1933, Peter Adolf Hitler came to power. Two Jewish kids in Cleveland created Superman. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster did not have to be very politically savvy to be aware of the events in Germany. Hitler, who had been impressed by American eugenics efforts to control human breeding, had been outspokenly anti-Semitic, and German Jews who saw the handwriting on the wall began to flee that country. In this country, there were American Nazis who became increasingly vocal and threatening. Anti-Semitism was prevalent in many circles, not just among local Nazis. American Jews were discriminated against and painfully aware that in order to get ahead, they had to change their names and hide their ethnicity. There was fear and anxiety in Jewish communities around the world. Let's look more closely into the historical landscape into which the Superman story was born. The Nazis promoted the ideology of social Darwinism, the survival of the fittest humans. In their narrative, the Germans were an Aryan people, a people of racial superiority. The Aryan German was the Ubermensch, or superior superman. Other peoples like Jews, Africans, and Slavs were inferior subhuman, or untermensch. 
The Aryan image was carefully designed to show the strength, purity, and goodness of the German people. As Uber mentioned, it was their destiny to be conquerors and dominate their world. There were some Nazis who, according to author Eric Kurlander and others, believed Aryans descended from space aliens and that Jesus and Moses were Aryans. These were not widely held beliefs. It was much more common for Nazi leaders to want to replace Christianity with paganism. Christianity, like Judaism, says we should treat others like we want to be treated. That did not align with the Nazi agenda for trampling Untermensch. The Jew, Hitler's quintessential Untermensch, was demonized, vilified, and horrific images of Jews were used to terrify German citizenry. This poster of the propaganda film, The Eternal Jew, is typical of anti-Semitic propaganda. Jews were allegedly dark and sinister, ugly, evil, malicious, and dangerous. This cover picture of a German publication from 1935 featured the winner of the most beautiful Aryan dating contest. She is supposed to be the prototypical ideal Aryan. So nonsensical is Nazi racial theory that the baby in this photo is a Jewish child <laughs> named Hesse Levinson. In 1936, the Olympics were held in Berlin. Jewish Olympians in the US and Europe had been discouraged, if not outrightly banned, from participating. African-American Jesse Owens, by winning four gold medals, pinned a lie to the Aryan superiority propaganda. And it was noted that Hitler left the stadium without acknowledging Owens' victory. Contemporaneously, there were efforts underway to bring Jewish children out Nazi-occupied areas to the U.S. and England. The effort to bring children to England, the kinder transport, was much more successful than the attempts to bring kids to the U.S., where the idea was hotly debated and rejected. As the Jews under German rule saw their world being destroyed, there were very few children who could escape to a safe haven. England took in about 10,000 unaccompanied children under the age of 17, the U.S. took in less than a thousand. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Esther, but it's important to recognize that these people were identified by the American government at the time as political refugees. <laughs> well, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> celebrate Passover, the story of the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt and their release from slavery and oppression. The book of Exodus tells the story of Moses, who was born during a very dangerous time, where male Jewish babies were to be killed. Moses survived because his mother placed him in a vessel and sent him down the Nile River. His life in peril, the infant Moses was set adrift in the hope that someone would find and care for him. In the Superman, Kal-El was in peril, placed in a vessel, and sent to earth, where it was hoped that someone would find and rescue him. Even the name Kal-El and his father Jor-El has Jewish significance. El is the one of the Jewish references to God. You may already know this. A synagogue named Bethel is house of God, or someone's name Michael, that means Michael, who is like God. Jewish tradition teaches us to do good for its own sake and to heal the world. And this is what Superman ultimately tries to do. He does not seek fame or financial gain. Siegel and Schuster lived in that environment with that confluence of influences. It wasn't until 1938 that Superman was first published, and their vision of this character had evolved in the years since he was first conceived. Superman was a singular American hero during some very dark years. As the world was on the brink of being conquered by the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, Superman represented strength, morality, justice, both legal and social, and the belief that everything would ultimately work out right. As we have come to know, Superman stands for truth, justice, and the American way. One of the differences between the Superman of Nazi propaganda and American Superman 
is that the goal of propaganda is to tell you what to think, feel, and do. With the comic books, you have the character's thoughts, words, and deeds, so you have insight into their moral dilemmas. This can get you to feel and act, but it might also get you to think about the pros and cons of the decisions you make. The Aryan Superman was an amoral brute and a bully. Survival of the fittest requires trampling the weak. Nazi Germany wanted to rule, and wherever they conquered in Europe, civilians were vulnerable to mass murder. World War II was different from previous conflicts because combatants were not the only <coughs> targets. In their quest to rule the world, the Aryan Germans sought Lebensraum, room to live. The people who were already there had to go. The weak were to be destroyed, so the strong could flourish. America's Superman was moral, kind, sensitive, and helpful. He easily could have conquered and destroyed, but his power was used for good. How many Americans were inspired to flights of fantasy by Superman who was mild-mannered except when he was called upon to step up and fight evil? How many kids imagined they, like Superman, might somehow be able to save the day? Let me share a personal insight from the perspective of a daughter of two Auschwitz survivors. Growing up, I fantasized that I could somehow, somehow, be a heroic savior of my people, bravely and successfully fighting the Nazis. As a child, Superman comics resonated with me, though I knew nothing about the character or its history. Propaganda was a very powerful tool during World War II. The Nazis used it successfully to promote their agenda and to demonize their enemies. America used it too. No one created more important and widely circulated Holocaust art than Arthur Schick. You can find his work in the book, Arthur Schick, Soldier in Art. Born in 1894 in Poland, Schick came to the US in 1940 and had a successful career as a political artist whose caricatures of Axis leaders made him popular in this country. Here's one of his. Using art was an important propaganda tool in the US. Note the skulls. Hitler's eyes. In addition to showing our enemies in a most unfavorable light, Schick also helped Americans understand what they were fighting for. In this picture, the capture went to be shot as dangerous enemies of the Third Reich. You see two Jewish children trembling in fear. They don't look very intimidating. Encouraging patriotism and American values was an important wartime goal. And in this picture, you see black, white, and Jew in common cause. This is from 1943. Schick was not the only Jewish refugee from Europe making a difference as an artist. Lily Renee Wilhelm was one of the first women in the comic book industry. Lily Renee was a Holocaust survivor who got out of Nazi-occupied Vienna as a Kinder transport child. After a very unpleasant time in England, she managed to come to the U.S. and rejoin her parents in the early 1940s. Until around 1941, only men worked in the comics, and the heroine, heroes were all masculine. Women were relegated to being the damsel in distress. You know, the hero needed to save her. You know the drill. In 1941, men went off to war, and women had to fill their jobs. Lily Renee started working as a penciler and inker with comic books for the Warriors and drew one of the first female heroines. Her work with the character Senorita Rio, the first Latina heroine in American comics, gave her the opportunity to do what she could not do in real life. Senorita Rio was a Brazilian nightclub entertainer who was also a spy fighting the Nazis. She was glamorous, wore nice clothes, which Lily Renee could not afford, and was powerful. Through her art, Lily Renee could also fight back against the Nazis. <coughs> to conclude, Superman was created and published shortly before the outbreak of World War II. Both Schick and Wilhelm came to the U.S. during the war years, used their talents to raise morale in the fight against Nazi Germany, and left their mark as pioneers in art. 
Today I gave you a very brief sampling of our created during the Holocaust. The legacy of the Holocaust includes the impact this watershed event in human history has had on our comics and our culture. And I thank you for being here today. And just so you know, Lily is alive today. She's 97 years old. civilized European cultures of the 20th century. Okay, they've been really naughty in World War I, but even after World War I, they had built up their country, their culture, German music. How could these people have orchestrated these crimes? And I'm just wondering if, if anyone has an answer here. I, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, so there isn't one answer. But it's something that, that I asked my father, and my father explained, because they're just like us. You know, there, there is no other that does these crimes. There are people like us, nice, middle-class, comfortable family people who wind up through manipulation, through propaganda, through lies, manipulated into committing the most heinous crimes that you can imagine. And, uh, and this is what, again, I think is important to remember. The, 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 the lesson here is not about the past. It is about the past but it's also how the past continues to inform our present and what we have to look out for. My grandfather, before he died, he wasn't a survivor. He had been in New York for a while. He was of Jack Kirby's generation. He said to me, remember Igor, the Nazis never disappeared. They just changed their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And on that plus, I'm sorry, Cosby Comics, which is at Liberty Station, also in Pretty Mesa, uh, has been a real proponent of Comics that tell accounts, that give accounts, and graphic novels that actually have some relevance to our young people and to us as well. So, Robert, what's going on later today, Kamikaze? Well, not at Kamikaze. I think you're talking about Ruthie's soccer Yes. Is yeah. that happening? No, oh, it's I'm not. Sorry. It's next to Kamikaze at oh. the uh, Women's Museum of California, uh, also in the Arts District Liberty Station. Uh, My so I hope so if you all have the chance to come by and listen to more of Ruthie's story. It's not with, uh, it's difficult to, to listen, have listened to all this and then, and then uh, talk to myself. I'm not a scholar, I'm a bookstore owner. Uh, but as a Jew, you know, I always took a great pride in knowing that so many of the books I grew up reading and enjoy uh, introducing to young readers today uh, were created by Jews. And I don't think that it's, uh, it's definitely not a coincidence that the majority of the characters were characters that were you know, built to inspire, uh, to deliver hope uh, to people who had no hope or little hope. Uh, you know, characters like Captain America, characters like Superman, uh, but basically, uh, you know, all of the characters that we're seeing in the movies today were all, almost all created uh, by probably first generation uh, Americans, but immigrants uh, who came here uh, for whatever reasons, whether they were political fortunate to be here. Um, and it's amazing, you know, Stan Lee, uh, doesn't sound very Jewish, but Stan Lieber and, and his brother Larry Lieber, uh, both uh, tremendously involved in creating most of the Marvel Universe uh, in one fashion or another. Uh, we mentioned Siegel and Schuster, um, definitely uh, from Canada, uh, but first generation uh, folks here also. Uh, it's I've got one more for you um, behind this one as we put up Captain America because in 1941 this was published. I guess nobody listened, so they tried to do it again. <laughs> I, I think that the greatest thing uh, that comics brought, uh, you know, the comics uh, were kind of like the original folk music. It was something that was an easy access. Anybody with a pencil. Uh, you know, a piece of paper could create. Uh, I heard that, uh, I believe it was 
I have a hard time remembering which was which, but I know it was Joe Schuster. Uh, his parents couldn't afford paper uh, when he was growing up, and he uh, would, would go to, from store to store looking for scraps of paper, receipts, anything he could find, and was able to find one day uh, a, a cache of uh, unused wallpaper. And for many years, uh, using the back of these rolls of wallpaper, he was able to, to begin his, his own street career as an artist that would lead him to, uh, to Superman one day. Uh, but it's just the ability uh, to be able to tell your story, to tell it unedited and unaltered, uh, and being able to put it out there for anybody to see, and we're not even having to talk about uh, whether it's going to be a commercially viable item. Uh, it just allows you uh, to share whatever it is that you're feeling, and I think that today, uh, probably more than ever before, uh, it's we've seen uh, we've seen what propaganda has wrought. We've seen what false news, fake news has wrought, and, and I think that uh, it's it's fantastic that we've had opportunities uh, like this and like the books that are coming out today. Uh, Juden Haas from Dave Sim, uh, Auschwitz, uh, uh, Joe Kubert's. Uh, many, many books, including uh, one of my favorite, Jocelyn, uh, which is a, uh, a faux recreation of his emigration uh, to the United States. Uh, just, uh, uh, he was able to escape uh, as uh, the Nazis invaded his hometown. Uh, in the book, young Jocelyn was not so fortunate. His mother wasn't allowed to travel because she was pregnant, and thus they were, uh, they were trapped in Poland. He was kind of like Dina Babbitt. He survived based on using his artwork uh, and drawings of, of soldiers uh, to kind of ingratiate himself and move in uh, to areas where he was able to come up with uh, information and uh, feed it to the resistance and help to uh, lead to the liberation. But there's just so many, so many different stories out there. I encourage you to seek them out. Very easy to find. There's a great uh, book that's out now called We Spoke Out, which collects quite a few stories. Um, very, very important book. Uh, and uh, I think that's about all I can say without repeating most of what was already said before. We're, we're, we've got a lot, there's a lot to cover. This is one hour, it's a wide subject. If you get anything out of today, please go do your research, look online, look for some of these publications, reread Mouse. It's all, it's all there. Um, let's open it up for questions. Who would, who would like to ask something? Please. There's a <clears throat> small press uh, woman by the name of Miriam Libicki who has a Holocaust uh, comic out, which I read yesterday. I read it. Um, <laughs> What's it called? It's, uh, it, it's about, I think it's called Ruchi, Ruchi. which is the name of... Uh, of the character, and it's a story of uh, someone at uh, two sisters at Auschwitz who uh, manage to survive because the older sister encourages the younger sister to um, to stand up straight and uh, so forth. And I, I, the author Miriam Libicki was telling me I did an interview with her that she was a little nervous about doing a Holocaust comic book because there's some some humor in there, and some people believe there's nothing funny about the Holocaust, you can never have a joke in there, but the two sisters would kid each other, and that's how they kind of kept each other's spirits up. So I wonder if you could please address the issue of humor, the Holocaust, comic books. Mama, humor, holo uh, humor the Holocaust, and comic books. And comic books. Well, you know, Jewish humor. <laughs> Jewish humor. Jewish humor. You know, it, it, it doesn't come from the 18th century. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't come from 2,000 years ago. It, it comes from the Holocaust because gallows humor is what people do to make sense of extreme suffering. You know, you make jokes. You make art. You make jokes. And you try to keep sane. Don't I believe you knew my dad, Kurt? Okay, was he the greatest jokester in the world? Yes, but not necessarily about the Holocaust. Right, but remember, in 1939, he was thrown out of his country from Austria. He had a tremendous amount of suffering. 
Look at Ruthie up here today. You heard her <laughs> talk, you heard how she does things. We've tried many different medicines. You wanna know that works the most? Humor, humor. And, and hope. it's and hope, of course, hope and humor. But um, there are days where sometimes you just feel like you hit a certain point and you don't wanna continue going down. So you figure out you have this certain humor and like she said, you learn to rise above it. Go ahead, Ruthie. Okay, when it comes to humor, uh, usually on Friday night, we crawled up to the third bank, and approximately 15, 20 women, my age, we were young, 15, 16 years old, and uh, we were pretending we are in the kitchen cooking, we are pretending we are running, we are swimming, we can do it. But what was your favorite meal? Tell about your favorite meal. Now that's humor. So, <laughs> no, it remember it was sauerkraut and dumplings? Oh, that I was dreaming about sauerkraut and dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, don't dwell on the bad side. Think of the positive side, the friendships you created with other people, I was in touch with them. Uh, until lately, there only is one left, the rest of them already passed away. Yeah, that's so, a good question, by the way. I can explain, it just occurred to me, I can explain Jewish humor in one sentence. That's an old Jewish proverb. Man makes plans while God laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> it sounds better in Yiddish. If you have any questions at all, you can go to try to remember, never forget, message me. I can get them to the panelists. We're very dear friends. Just because we're up here today doesn't mean that we don't speak to each other. Right, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're here for you. Um, Ruthie's here for you. Don't be afraid to send her whatever messages. I hope that we can see you tonight. Um, I'm so glad we have this time. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to miss y'all. And um, we have time for one more question. I or? think we do. I just time. Yeah. Next time. I'm so I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Can we come? Can we come back next year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a Let them know you want us back and we'll be back.